A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. The high priest rose up and all his companions, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, laid hands upon the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, the angel of the Lord opened the doors of the prison, led them out, and said, Go and take your place in the temple area and tell the people everything about this life. When they heard this, they went to the temple early in the morning and taught. When the high priest and his companions arrived, they convened in the Sanhedrin, the full senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the jail to have them brought in. But the court officers who went did not find them in the prison. So they came back and reported, we found the jail securely locked and the guards stationed outside the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. When the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard this report, they were at a loss about them as to what this would come to. Then someone came in and reported to them, the men who you put in prison are in the temple area and are teaching the people. Then the captain and the court officers went and brought them, but without force, because they were afraid of being stoned by the people. Verbum Domini. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall ever be in my mouth. Let my soul glory in the Lord. The lowly will hear me and be glad. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us together extol his name. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. Look to him, that you may be radiant with joy, and your faces may not blush with shame. When the poor one called out, the Lord heard, and from all his distresses he saved him. The, Lord hears the, Lord. the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Taste and see how good the Lord is. Blessed the man who takes refuge in him. Sancti Evangelii secundum Ioannem. Gloria God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned. 
But whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the verdict, that the light came into the world, but people prefer darkness to light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light so that his works might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. Verbum Domini. During the uh, Holy Year of Mercy, there was an extraordinary documentary that was done about the original Divine Mercy image. There's a whole story behind the original Divine Mercy image, the only one that St. Faustina saw and that she was involved in directing how it was to be made. And there, there's commentary that's uh, given by Cardinal Jivic, uh, Bishop Barron, George Weigel, and uh, other renowned authors and speakers about the uh, Divine Mercy image, this original image. And it was in uh, February 22nd, 1931, that Jesus appeared to St. Faustina as the King of Divine Mercy. And it was there that he instructed that there would be an image made, an image that would be painted. You know, one of her sisters, Sister Christine, said that the people outside that night of that appearance of our Lord to St. Faustina said that there was this light that was coming from the window, this unexplained light that was coming from the window. This was a time before electricity. And so St. Faustina first tried to make the image herself with charcoal on canvas, but it wasn't successful. And the Lord said that he would give her visible help. Well, she was transferred from the uh, convent where she was in Plock in Poland, eventually to one in Vilnius, which is in modern day Lithuania, where she worked as a gardener. This was May of 1933. And there had just been a new confessor assigned to the community by the name of Father Michael Sopoko. He's now blessed Michael Sopoko. He's a newly appointed confessor. And it was her, together with Father Michael, that he enlisted this uh, Polish artist, very much unknown at the time, Eugenius Kazimierowski. And so he painted this, they worked hours over the course of six months. Father Michael would be a model for some of the part of the image. And St. Faustina herself would make different corrections of that image. And ultimately, that was this original image that was created, the only one that St. Faustina saw and was involved in. I have to say as well, she wasn't completely happy with it. it just how could you ever capture you know, what our Lord looked like? But it was the one that she was involved in directing and, and believed to be the closest representation of what she saw. But it was then that the Soviet occupation took place and this painting went through great difficulties. It went into hiding. It was smuggled. It was sold. It was abandoned. It was forgotten, stolen. Until finally, after 70 years of wandering, it was finally transported back across the dangerous border between Lithuania and Belarus by two nuns who underwent what was called a mission impossible to bring this back to Lithuania, to Vilnius, where it is enshrined today in this beautiful uh, city of mercy in Vilnius, placed above the altar. 
One of the things that Bishop Barron says in this documentary is that in the original image, image you, know, you often see like an archway or something that our Lord is coming out of, but that wasn't in the original image. All you see behind our Lord is this dark background. That's all it is, it's just this dark background. And then our Lord is coming out of that darkness or he's in that darkness, but he's pointing to his breast from which this pale ray and this ray of red is coming out of his divine mercy. And his right hand, which is pierced, is in blessing. It's really a symbol of charity. But Bishop Barron comments on that, that he's really the one, when you think about this, only the background is, is dark. He is that light that has broken the darkness. He is that light. And the light of his resurrection, the glory of his resurrection, as we continue in this Easter uh, season of 50 days, is an annual reminder of that truth, you know, that we live in the light. We are children of the light. We are destined for glory. As I mentioned the other day, that a crown of glory awaits us. And let us not, you know, let go of that crown or let that crown be taken from us. But let us persevere in faithfulness to the Lord, the one who is the light. And so we heard that beautiful text of John's Gospel, chapter 3, this morning. That God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. That it wasn't God's will to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through his son, Jesus. But then John continues to say, the light came into the world. This is the verdict. This light came into the midst of the darkness. The light came, but many people preferred the darkness to the light. They preferred to continue in their works of evil rather than to come toward the light. They preferred the darkness to the light. But then he goes on to say that everyone who does wicked things hates the light, does not come toward the light, so that his works might not be exposed, but whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. So we want to be those who, through our whole life, that's really the, the meaning of our life, is that we haven't arrived yet. We're still walking toward the light. And every day can be another step higher in that life of union, of drawing closer to the light. You know, it's said as you climb the mountain, and often the mountain is used as a symbol of growing in the spiritual life, that as you climb the mountain, your companions become fewer. And it becomes difficult as you get higher sometimes. But then you begin to see more clearly, you begin to see with a greater uh, a vision, with greater depth and greater penetration and greater perspective, a wider vision. And that's really our journey in the spiritual life, that it's never over, that we continue walking toward the light. And the Lord enlightens our minds. He deepens our understanding. We grow in this life and love with God. I wanted to say a word as well about the angels, that we heard of them twice in today's readings, in today's first reading, how they were assisting the early church. And so, the apostles were put into jail, the public jail, but during the night, an angel opens the doors. So you can imagine the surprise when the Sanhedrin go there the next day. They send, well, bring them out of the jail. They're not there. But the guards are in place. The doors are locked. Well, those men, they're out there preaching in the temple. I would imagine one of the first questions that they asked him is, how'd you get out? And they must have said, well, it was an angel. Maybe there was some that it had affected them. An angel. Yes, an angel. 
led us out of the jail and told us to go and to preach about this life. And so that's what the angel said, go take your place in the temple area and tell the people everything about this life. And so it is this new life, this new life in Christ who enlightens the darkness of our hearts. That was a prayer of St. Francis. Almost high and glorious God, cast your light into the darkness of my heart. These are ones that, that gives us this new life, this life of glory that begins even now. Even now in a particular way at the mass, we come close to the risen Lord and we have this holy communion with him. And that's a little foretaste of our own resurrection, St. John Paul II says, of that fullness of the life of glory that we will one day enjoy. And then today's Psalm, Psalm 34, also speaks about the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Taste and see how good the Lord is. Walk toward that light. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Continue walking toward the light, living in the truth. I couldn't help but think this morning of, you know, the day before Mother Angelica's funeral last year, we had received an email from a viewer who had been away from the church for like 20 years. And he was in a hotel, and as often happens with EWTN, he's going through the channels and he sees this nun and at first, he's kind of taken aback, and he just keeps going through the channels. But then curiosity got the best of him, and so he goes back and sees what this nun has to say. And at that point, Mother was talking about the angels and our own guardian angel. And she was saying, you know, if I was your guardian angel and you hadn't thanked me that night for watching over you, I'd kick you out of bed or something like that. <laughs> and he could believe that she said that. And he's kind of laughing to himself, you know, what she, he had just heard. And so he goes to bed, he's still kind of chuckling to himself and he falls asleep. And in the middle of the night, he has this sense that he's falling. And in fact, he was, he was falling out of bed. <clears throat> and he landed on his backside and he said, I hadn't done that since I was a little, little boy. And then those words of mother came to him that if I was your guardian angel and you hadn't thanked me that night, I'd kick you out of bed. <laughs> and so he just laughed, but then he got on his knees and he thanked his guardian angel for watching over him that day and came back to the practice of his faith because of that event. You see, what we believe in, there's something more than meets the eye at work. There's something beyond the natural, beyond political tensions and forces of nations and, you know, dictators and all of these sorts of things. There's much more going on. There's something greater, far greater at work in what we believe. And that's why the gospel has always attracted and drawn people because it is the truth. It is the light in the midst of the darkness of this world. And it's what our hearts most deeply long for. And it even has angelic assistance in the propagation of that message. It has angelic assistance. Do we ever avail ourselves of the help of the angels in our own work, in the own, our own particular mission the Lord has given us to extend the kingdom of God? Do we ever avail ourselves and ask the angels, our own guardian angel, other angels to assist us so that this work can bear fruit. Know that we have these heavenly helpers and also know that the Lord is that light of the world that St. John spoke of. There are many that prefer the darkness, they choose the darkness, and yet there are many that will respond to that call to walk toward the light and to live in the truth. So may the Lord sustain us always in hope Hope springs eternal. Why? Because the light has conquered the darkness, because God has manifested his love to us. He has revealed that he has so loved the world that he has sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life.